So, um, at the risk of, of, of overselling this, I want to say why we did this, which this beautiful cover here. But, you know, we have 12 covers and we devoted one of them to big data in medicine. Big data meets biology. And that's how big it is um, to the outside world. Obviously, you all know it's, it's giant. Um, the rest of the business community really understands the, 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 the force of this movement and how, how enormous it is. And as we were taking this deep dive, we looked at how much data there was you know, between genomics and the liquid biopsies that were coming out and uh, x-rays and CT scans and clinical records and all that. And when you slough all of that off, it's about 750 million quadrillion bytes every day. That's an enormous amount. So I'm going to just jump right in. Lori, with all that big data, where is the precision in there? Where, where do you find the, 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 the individual bits of data that, that you say this is going to direct me right to, to a medical therapeutic? So first of all, I also want to thank um, mm -hmm. Robert and Jonathan for their incredible investment in precision medicine because uh, it is only with resources like this that we actually can move ahead quickly. And, also thank Nitin and Monica for your generous donation to Dana-Farber to do precisely that for immunotherapy. Um, let me just say that we are in an amazing time for cancer. We're, there are two revolutions going on. There is precision medicine where we recognize that cancer is a disease of genes and genes that are mutated. And then there is immunotherapy which activates our own immune system to fight off the tumor cell. And this has transformed a field that was pretty dim and unexciting for many, many years into something that I think we can all look forward to, um, making cancer at some point a manageable disease, if not curing it. So I just want to say that mm -hmm. to set the stage that, um, that the, the mission that we are all trying to accomplish. And as part of that mission, I want to echo what Kathy said. We must work together. I can tell you how hard our doctors and nurses and senior management work every day. And we're not doing it for our own glory. We're doing it because we want to treat the patients that we take care of. And to do that, we must collaborate across institutions. The Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center Consortium is the largest comprehensive cancer center in the world. And we are just so blessed to have Mass General, Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health, Beth Israel, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston Children's Hospital, and Dana-Farber all working together and sharing data. So to your point, how do, we, mm -hmm. how do we make sense of all these data? So we are part, Dana-Farber's part of a 15 uh, cancer center consortium called Genie where we do share all data. So let me give you an example. Let's say we identify and how this translates to putting patients quickly into clinical trials. Let's say we find at Dana-Farber a rare mutation that's present in 2% of patients who have bladder cancer. But it's a rare mutation. And we don't have enough patients to do a clinical trial. We can go into that database and call up Memorial Sloan Kettering or Johns Hopkins or one of the other members of that consortium and say, do you have patients who have this rare mutation? Mm -hmm. Because there's this huge database of all these genetic mutations. We sequence the tumor of every single person who comes to Dana-Farber. And so you can then gather 10, 15, 20 patients and do a very quick trial because you've got a drug that's in clinical trial that attacks that mutation. Now you have a small group of patients who have that mutation. That can result in approval of that drug very quickly. But it's all because we're sharing data. Okay, so okay, let me just follow up on this. Is this happening, just to give our, our audience here some perspective, is this happening now or is this the thing that we see on the horizon? No, this is happening now. So you're seeing... This is absolutely happening now with this consortium of, and I think, you know, mm -hmm. as, as our vice president said, I was on the blue ribbon panel that he right. convened, you know, we have to share our data mm -hmm. if we want to move this field forward as quickly as we can. So let me jump to Bill, because you've got the Genie program through AACR. Bill, you've got Orion through your cancer centers, which also has a lot of community uh, cancer centers in there as well. Um, 
you know, at what point do these different genetic platforms begin to talk to each other? Okay, excellent question. That is about data sharing, and I also want to thank the, the, the crafts and, and uh, uh, Kathy and, and, and Richard and team for putting this together. This forum is what we need mm -hmm. in order to have these kind of discussions to address those questions, uh, which is really the most important start. What's the question, right? Yeah. And I speak to that because there are different efforts ongoing to develop, to develop precision medicine. I think the recognition of data sharing is, is there. It's how do we do it and at what level, and I would suggest what question. And I'm a fan of Clayton Christensen. What's the job you're trying to do? And design an effort, if you will, a collective effort through collective impact, bringing in multiple stakeholders to look at a question. And I think what you're seeing is different groups we're still early in this stage of precision medicine. We've been talking about it a lot, but it's actually, as Laura just said, it's actually starting to happen. But I would say it's still not embryonic, it's been born, but it's still early, it's infants, in its infancy. And with Orion, which stands for Oncology Research Information Exchange Network, we have 17 cancer centers from multiple states serving multiple different populations of diverse populations Coming together, same protocol, same consent, same data dictionary, we agreed all together and say we need to harmonize the effort day one. Otherwise, when you start trying to compare data that's gathered in different ways with different data elements, uh, and, and you're talking about different languages. So I think as we start this effort, it's probably a good thing we have multiple efforts because what we are going to do is learn. The importance is as we develop these different efforts, hopefully based on what job you're trying to do, is that there is a convergence of network of networks. So the agreement, and this is what this platform should be addressing, how do we converge? Mm -hmm. How do we address a question that needs convergence? And it's beginning to happen between Jeannie and Orion. We agreed that we would work with Morehouse uh, College of Medicine to assist them in building the infrastructure for genomic precision medicine in predominantly African American uh, uh, individuals. So, but it took Jeannie and Orion to come together to say, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to share the data generated by helping Morehouse build their system. So ultimately the aim is to find either telltale mutations or biomarkers that can guide th uh, therapy. Right. Uh, but it's people like you, Tony, that actually are developing drugs that are going to be using those markers to, to help inform smarter, more targeted treatments. So when you were, you were working at Onyx, you developed a couple of big drugs, uh, uh, important for myeloma in particular, uh, are you now refocused in the way you do your job? Do you, are you actually thinking in terms of precision medicine when you start to develop a drug? So the answer is absolutely. So first, Robert, my, my good friend, and Jonathan, thank you guys for, uh, for hosting. And okay, now I'm the only one who hasn't thanked Robert. <laughs> okay, so thank well, you I, I wasn't going to be that you. guy, so. <laughs> All right, okay. We're pals. Okay. I think they're tired of being, are you tired of being thanked? So that was a good morning and hello, but. It's, it's but, a team, as Robert said. <laughs> the, the, the answer is absolutely. Absolutely, and, and for a variety of reasons. So let's just take the last week of my life. I've been in three separate conversations on this very topic uh, with the FDA, with the NIH, and obviously within Humanity, the company which isn't focused on cancer therapeutics, but Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, where there's a separate conversation about precision medicine that we have to have. That all follows uh, my involvement with CRISPR therapeutics uh, mm -hmm. as well, where this is a, a vibrant conversation. The, the really interesting notion here is that each one of those conversations approached this from a very different vantage point. And, and everyone's casting about and scratching at the same thing. So the beauty of this initiative is to look at the interdisciplinary approach that we need to try to address these problems. What's happening in industry right now is probably unprecedented, mostly because this is, if you will, the platinum age of science. We've got tools we've never had before. We've got insights we've never had before. But we don't have the complete understanding 
of what we're learning on a biological basis with the expression of the disease. So the simple distinction between the genotype and the phenotype. Because we understand exactly what the genome is telling us should happen, but it doesn't always happen. Same is true in Alzheimer's. You can have plaque in your brain, but never develop the disease. How does that happen? So the answer probably lies in further elucidation of the relationship between the clinical picture and the genome. And this is what we're trying to unlock, unlock at, at every turn. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, we, we keep collecting more and more, so we're not only collecting genomic information, but now you're doing immune profiling on pretty much everybody, yes. right? Yes. I mean, and so we're collecting more and more, and I was thinking about Richard Hammermesh's uh, comment before to me about the old story of the guy who loses his keys and he looks under the street lamp, um, and they say, well, why are you looking for it there? Well, that's where the light is. And my, uh, you know, it's it's an old joke, but it's very telling in the sense, are, are we just collecting collecting more and more information because that's what we can measure or or do we actually have a game plan to narrow this down? Yeah. So this is where machine learning I think comes mm. in because you have to connect as Tony said the genotype all those genomic data and all those immuno profiling data of the immune system together with the patient's chart with the mm. patient's symptoms. Now you know, AI is exploding. It's still early stages. But can you imagine how much we could learn if we could take the pathology of a patient, mm -hmm. digitize it, let the machine figure out what are the 20 or so characteristics, merge that with the imaging data, all the X-ray and MRI data, with the actual patient's chart? Did Mrs. Jones respond to immunotherapy? Mm -hmm and Mrs. Smith didn't respond, why is that? What's different about their immune systems? Okay, so we do all the immunoprofiling, all the genomic profiling, we interrogate the patient's chart, we have the pathology, we have the imaging, we put it all together and have somebody who's smarter than we are, the computer, learn it because they can, the, the, this, the machine can figure out many, many more variables and put them all together than a human brain can do. And that is the ultimate goal, so, right? So we, we want to be able to predict ahead of time which drugs any given patient should be on, right? We should be able to take all that data and say, all right, Mrs. Smith, you should be on drug A, C, and F, but Mrs. Jones, that, those drugs aren't going to work for you. Or if they work for you, you're going to have terrible autoimmune side effects, as, as you alluded to, Kathy. And so we're going to put you on this combination rather than that combination. So let, let me ask the, the indelicate question of cost, right? So all this data is expensive to procure, to, to store, uh, to make sense of. Um, you know, in the past, a lot of the, the process of determining which drugs were going to be effective, where the risks were, where the potential side effects were, fell on the, the, the shoulders of the drug companies that were making it, we're going to see a profit out of this. I mean, you know, a lot of these cancer centers, academic medical centers, are doing the sort of heavy lifting for this. How are you going to pay for that? Oh, gosh. <laughs> we had this conversation before. This is, you know, we are really in, um, I would say, the perfect storm at this point, academic medical centers. We, we cannot forget the critical role of basic science. If Gordon Freeman at Dana-Farber had not discovered the PDL1 gene, we would not have all of the immunotherapeutics that are currently on the market because they're directed against that PD-1 gene. And that was just basic science. That was just Gordon working in his lab, you know, looking at computer sequences and finding, oh my goodness, this gene looks interesting. So we got to support basic science. We really must. And at this point in time, the NIH budget, if it had kept pace with yeah. inflation, would now be at 45, 47 billion dollars, not at 37 billion dollars. So not enough NIH funding for basic research. At the same time in Massachusetts, healthcare reimbursements are not matching, the rate of inflation of healthcare reimbursements are not matching the increase rate in medical costs. So we're, we're in a perfect storm and this is why philanthropy such as the crafts have done for many, many different places. Uh, and, and many other generous donors are just so vital to keeping 
this, these efforts moving forward because academic medical centers are under threat. And if we lose them, this country loses its innovation. We might as well just cede it mm -hmm. to China. Let me get Tony and Bill in this. Yeah. Well, uh, ju just yeah. on this point of cost, so th this is really a question of leadership, I think, Clifton. Mm -hmm. And Laurie's absolutely right on the numbers for the NIH. But the NIH has taken a big step with the All of Us Precision Medicine Cohort Trial, mm -hmm. which seeks to enroll one million individuals across the country, do a whole genome sequencing on them, and then correlate that with their clinical and disease presentations. So from the government and the sponsored research side of things, that's a start. You've got to develop the data. You've got to understand the basic biological questions. Regeneron, which is one of the large biotech, uh, biopharmaceutical companies, and for disclosure, I'm on the board of Regeneron, but Regeneron has from its own coffers started the Regeneron Genome uh, Cl Clinical Genome Center, where they do whole genome sequencing and have partnered with um, health insurers and providers, Geisinger for instance, and now the UK Biodata Bank, to enroll as many individuals do whole genome sequencing and at their cost. Mm -hmm. So isn't that interesting? So for the first time ever you've got a biotech company without particular respect or interest for the diseases they care about, mm -hmm. looking to, to do the broader work of understanding not just the biology but the relationship between the genome and, uh, and the clinical outcome. And that's why I say this is a matter of leadership. Leaders can choose to focus on these kinds of things because mm -hmm. they're the kinds of things that will advance the field. Mm -hmm. Bill, I know. I think this is, uh, not to hand wave, but the collective impact when you're talking about cost. Mm -hmm. If every institution, if every industry had to pay their entire cost for what they wanted to do in using big data, this would never happen, especially at academic centers. We don't have that kind of resource. But if we can create an ecosystem of different stakeholders, in this case, academic centers, uh, the pharma industry, uh, patient advocacy groups, come together and share the cost. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of emphasis on sharing information, absolutely, but in order to create that information, we're gonna have to share the cost. And what's happening, and I, I'm, I'm very excited about this, the industries, especially within pharma itself, are recognizing a pre-competitive space. They are, for example, in Orion, we have multiple pharma all contributing, but they're all looking at the same data. Mm -hmm. They have agreed to share the cost amongst the industry itself, which allows the academic centers that actually generated that data also complete access right. to that. So, so it's going to that, take that sort of collective impact to make that happen. That, that still doesn't really answer the question, I think, of how do we support academic medical centers? Because, you know, this is really where the transformative discoveries take place. There's, no, you know, there's nothing to translate into therapeutics for patients if you don't do the basic biomedical research. And I do think that most academic medical centers partner very happily with pharma or biotech, and I think that's great. I've always been a huge proponent of that kind of collaboration because it's best for our patients. But I do think the academic medical centers need to receive a little more in return when they've done the groundbreaking work that has enabled a pharmaceutical company. And believe me, I've been on the board of Bristol Myers Squibb for years, and now I'm on the board of GSK. So, um, you know, I understand it from, from both points of view. But they do need to give back more to support academic medical centers. So, could we? Could we get a little further along in the process when we say, here's a great discovery, here's a great target, we need to develop a drug against it, and we do develop some drugs at Dana-Farber, but by and large, they get developed in pharma. Can't you give us more credit for what we did by giving us a higher percent royalty, for example, or you know, better milestones? So, so what we're really talking about, I want to open up for questions, actually, and comments from the, from the audience. So if you've got something, please, uh, oh, Kathy, you've got one. Oh, there you go. I was. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, while well, the mic is getting there, I mean, what we're really talking about is creating a new business model. 
in yes. some respects. Yeah. And this is what Kathy was talking about when she was talking about venture uh, philanthropy. And uh, something tells me she was also just talking about venture in some respects. But but understanding that there needs to be new combinations, new new sourcing of uh, of not just on the cost side but on the revenue well, side. Right. Well, let, let, yeah. we should be very clear. Right. Yeah. The, the biopharmaceutical industry can't fund these kinds of initiatives. It's not what we're good at. We don't have mm -hmm. sufficient resources on an individual company basis. So finding a way to support sponsored research, federally sponsored research, is exactly the right thing to do. And we're, we're doing the right thing. You disagree. Well, I agree. Oh, yeah. I was seeing this. <laughs> there has to be a bigger return yeah. on it. It's more well, fun but, when you disagree, but that's, uh, you know. And you should, and you can disagree, but, I, but, but federally sponsored research is essential. Yeah. I will tell you, biopharmaceutical companies, and I've been on the other side of these conversations, would be delighted to share royalties with yeah. academic medical centers. Now, that's, now, this is, goes back to leadership, because you won't find all of my colleagues who will say that. Mm -hmm. But if you're bringing something meaningful to the table in terms of basic biological insight and insight regarding a specific target, I think academic medical centers should be compensated. Yeah. Uh, and Because that's the incentive that's provided yeah. for that new business model. Well, I'm, I'm about. delighted to hear you say that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, my question goes back to when we look at immune um, and trying to understand the data around immune. I mean, I think it's great that Dana-Farber will do immune profiling of all these patients, right? But at the end of the day, we don't understand the efficacy and the safety of a lot of these drugs. And what we've heard over and over again is there's two ways to get that data. One is, of course, start you know data sets like what Dana-Farber is doing. But if you're doing it, that only gets us one data set. Your data set needs to be combined with other data sets so we can really understand what's going on. And that's, that's not as easy to do as it might sound. Secondly is the data set that most of the immune folks want is the data sets coming out of the trials. And you know, technically, industry owns that. So it's put us you know, as, as um, trusted third parties in a place where we're now going to be putting millions and millions to develop a top-down immune data set of our patients. And then we now have to start doing the trials ourselves. And you know, there's a number of groups doing this where we hold the IND, um, and we pay for it so we can get the data. The question to me is, there has got to be a pre-competitive space in here around the safety and efficacy of, name it, CAR-T or whatever it would be. Yeah. And I know that sounds easy to do. I can promise you, I think it's something that we could do up here. Like, mm -hmm. I think the people in this room are collaborators and willing to find that sweet spot of where we can come together for a pre-competitive consortium. But it's not going to be easy. So this is really a great point, Kathy. And um, we're trying to do this at Dana-Farber. So the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center Consortium does over a 1,000 clinical trials. And over a third of them are phase one, the early phase in that pre-competitive space, right? And some of those are investigator initiated. We would like more of those trials to be funded by venture philanthropy or philanthropy so that we could do the IND, right? And so that, I mean, we, we, we always, in any case, analyze those tissue samples from patients, because that's really what you want to do, right? You put a patient on a drug, you've done all the profiling I talked about a few minutes ago, so you've got a huge collection of data, put them on the drug, and then you take another biopsy and do the same thing. And that's where you learn who needs to go on what drug. But I totally agree with you. We want to keep in the academic institutions more phase 1A and phase 1B clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And share, and share those data. Well, share those well, data. But we say that, but it doesn't, it's not that easy. And then I no. think you also, no. it, you know, the data is not standardized. Everybody's not. using a different assay. Yeah. So Dana Farber has one assay, UPenn has another assay. So somebody has to, I mean, and this may end up being us, somebody has to say, you know what, and it could be NCI too. We will only fund, like somebody's got to put a stake in the ground and say, we, we're going to go look at immune this way. The, these are the tests we're going to do. This is the assay we're going to use. Otherwise, we end up with endless data sets that we can't do as much with because they're not structured. But, so so can't yeah, a leader yeah. come in and say, it's not just Dana-Farber. It's not. It's Dana-Farber and UPenn and MD Anderson and a few but, others that really we, care about the space. we share our data. I know it's not, but it's, it's not that easy. 
I wish I could say that we could all go look at that data set. I, I look at a pre-competitive space as people agreeing on what question we're trying to answer, what data we need for that, and bring the academic centers, the patient groups, whoever together in a, oh, yes. and a philanthropist um, or a foundation who's willing to fund it and see if we could put it together uh -huh. that way. And then it becomes a data set that everybody can use. I'm completely everybody. open oh, to let's do any. It. So <laughs> let, me ask, I, let me ask you, Bill, and then I want you to jump in here. But you know, when we think about the technology outside of this space that we deal with every day, the internet, we think, OK, we take it for granted. It's this, this common set of protocols, TCP, IP, the common languages, common rules. Not a lot of rules, but gets everybody on the same on-ramp. Bill, could we imagine, can we get that? With this, uh, these uh, in, a, in, a, in a structured data sen sense, with all of the stuff that we're collecting now. Yeah, much. I think the answer is yes, and I'm, I'm going to emphasize Kathy's point. But it does take. This is as much an experiment in sociology as it is in science. Yeah. And at least with Orion, there were 17 cancer centers, all fabulous centers, all agreed. Same proto. We agreed day one. Harmonize the effort. Mm -hmm. so that the data dictionary is the same across 17 centers, all enrolling patients in one protocol, mm -hmm. which now has over 200,000 patients in it, and agreeing to a single platform for such things as whole exome sequencing and RNA-seq, single platform. Now 17 centers contributing their various patients of a wide variety of ethnicity, et cetera, on the same platform, and the so it can be done. Can do this too. Yes, Our, saying, that's what's amazing. Our, and the we do that in our yeah, we do that in our satellites. So this is amazing. Yeah. So I, you know, I want to jump in, Tony. But but we've got and we've got a comment there. But one question. I mean, Robert and Jonathan uh, found funded this effort, and the key word here is accelerator. So I, we don't have that much time, and I would love to get one thought where we can accelerate this precision medicine effort from each of you. So to, let me begin yeah. with Tony, since you have it. So I, I think there, there are two approaches to consider. One would be a more traditional approach, which is where we take one disease right. and we knit the various pieces together, which are the, the biology, the genotype, the phenotype, the expression for data collection, data analysis, and, and really learn as much, go as deep as we can on one disease. Would I you think. be okay if that's baldness or no? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's yeah, actually just, a good place to okay, start. Good, so. Right. Um, so, yeah. so that's one. Right. The yeah. other would actually be to, which was interesting in Kathy's introduction, going across a number of diseases, pick one element. Mm -hmm. So whether it's data standardization and data collection, mm -hmm. I don't think we can do everything across all diseases. I think mm -hmm. we've got to focus if this is going to be successful. I've been in this conversation about pharmacogenomics, for those of you who remember that term, since mm -hmm. 1997. So that's mm -hmm. 21 years ago, and we haven't made the kind of progress. So focus is going to be essential. Yeah. Lori? Well, I'm going to harken back to the quote from Robert which I don't remember exactly, but um, the Patriots win not because there's an individual star, but because it's a team. And if we keep that foremost in our minds and concentrate on collaboration and finding a treatment for cancer, and that is our goal, that is our mission, I think to the sociology point of view, this will work out. Mm -hmm. so. I'm going to use Tony's term. I think we're in the platinum age primarily in basic science mm -hmm. because we are at the threshold now of using in silico analysis to do what would take years to synthesize, to study one, doing one experiment. Now we can look at experiments in silico. Mm -hmm. And the amount of, of discovery is accelerating, and the key word is accelerating. It will occur through in silico analysis. We need, though, to in the medical sciences, we're the worst at this, of creating networks that does harmonize the approach. But we need to learn from the physicists and the mathematicians that create networks readily. They Everything they do is team science. Mm -hmm. And they can make in silico design or an, an analysis. For example, they use it as pattern recognition for event prediction. Pattern analysis for event prediction. That's what we're trying to do. There are other sciences that are doing this on a daily basis. We need to learn from them. 
Is we've got 40 seconds left. Is there a question? Oh, we've got a comment right there. Comment right there. Got a question? I was just going to say that um, talking about large data and standardizing large data is a losing battle. We we can't introduce friction into a system that is by definition messy. The practice of medicine isn't always pretty. The side effects that we talk about that we want to try to prevent are prevented by physicians in an operating room intervening in the best way they see fit. And the last thing they're going to do is try to figure out how to standardize the data. What we got to look at is we have to think outside our little box that we have set in. Forget about standardizing clinical trials and having the same clinical trial run across everything. We got to get out of our little box and go into the Russian hackers that hacked into Facebook and figure out how they did it. Because they standardized all that data, made it usable, figured out how to target people. And we got we to gotta just break this walls that we have introduced ourselves. Friction is not going to help us. What's going to help us is bringing technologies from outside our field into try to put you know, the artificial intelligence needed to have a computer standardize the data after the fact. Right. Let's start. Let's stop thinking about the same used models that haven't worked for 27 years. Well, I have to say, I never thought we would end this discussion with Russian hackers. <laughs> uh, but with that, I want to thank Lori, Tony, Bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.